Hello, uh, welcome to our program of digital pathology slide review and sign out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where I'm professor of pathology. Our program today is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a joint venture with the Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. The case came to my attention from my colleague in pediatric pathology, Dr. Henry Tran, who's also been a guest on some of our programs. Um, it involved a 14-year-old young woman who had presented to her family physician uh, when it was noted that she was uh, developing a uh, degree of uh, uh, virilization. Um, and so the symptoms of virilization that we usually think of are uh, abnormal hair growth, hirsutism, uh, premature development of axillary or pubic hair, uh, acne, uh, amenorrhea or other menstrual disorders, sometimes a deepening voice, uh, maybe a genital or clitoral enlargement, as well as uh, hypoplasia or a shrinkage of the breast tissue. And there may be some other alterations in the distribution of fat and muscle in these uh, patients. And uh, if they're older, when this occurs, that, that can also result in a decreased libido as well. Um, these are serious symptoms and indicate something hormonally is uh, going uh, on. Uh, in younger women, you might think of a number of possibilities. And of course, the first thing should be investigated is whether or not there's any medications or uh, source of uh, anabolic steroids or androgenic uh, uh, promoting drugs that are creating an imbalance in her hormonal milieu. But additionally, we need to think about adrenal and ovarian neoplasms that can produce <clears throat> androgenic effects, uh, as well as uh, the benign disorder, polycystic ovarian disease, which can uh, uh, produce a, a, an increased uh, amount of androgenic steroids as well. Uh, in younger patients, but sometimes in uh, adolescents as well, there are a, a, a congenital disorders that can result in uh, hypertestosteronism or production of uh, testosterone precursors that also can have this effect. Uh, so the general evaluation has been recommended to follow a sequence something like this, that you do uh, medical history, physical examination, evaluate the maturation of the bones and so forth, um, and then do a number of uh, hormonal evaluations that include serum testosterone, uh, dihydroepiandosterone, and 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Uh, these are both precursor elements to see what's going on. And then, of course, correlating with the uh, rate of onset of these symptoms, that may uh, direct you towards <clears throat> either the more uh, uh, congenital disorders uh, disorders of sexual differentiation and so forth, or if it's more rapid onset to a potentially neoplastic disorder. And then from there, the uh, investigation can become fairly complicated, and I won't go into that, but uh, this reference down here at the bottom will provide a great deal of uh, information about further uh, evaluation. But uh, key in this, of course, uh, is the process of uh, doing some imaging studies to look at uh, what's going on in the pelvis, to look at what may be going on in the adrenals uh, as well. And so in our patient, a, uh, <clears throat> an MRI scan of the pelvis did indeed disclose uh, the presence of this uh, somewhat enhancing uh, fluidish like uh, mass, uh, which you see here, um, uh, juxtaposed uh, to the uterus on one side. Uh, so with the presence of an ovarian mass, and uh, these virilizing symptoms, the likelihood then becomes uh, most strongly that this patient has um, an ovarian tumor that is producing hormones. Um, and uh, in this age group, the most likely tumor for that to be would be a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Uh, so she underwent surgical excision of this mass, which as you see disclosed a mostly solid, but uh, some cystic area lesion with a uh, fairly blue appearance and variable areas of nesting and some open glandular-like structures, uh, as you can see here. Um, as we look at these uh, glands uh, and uh, tissues here, you can see that many of them are lined by a fairly uh, tall columnar type cells with a palisaded appearance. Um, and 
There is uh, some enlargement of the nuclei, but there is uh, generally a, uh, an orderly array. There's not a lot of mitotic activity uh, going on here. And so uh, a glands of this sort might look a little bit like uh, epithelium um, uh, and um, have uh, that sort of a pattern. You might think about an endometrioid type of, of lesion. And in fact, uh, sometimes this pattern has been referred to as the pseudo endometrioid pattern. Uh, but if that were all that we were seeing here, we might be uh, easily persuaded that uh, this was an epithelial neoplasm. But uh, as we look around here a little more carefully, you'll see that uh, the stroma here also has some distinctive features. First, it's quite pink. Um, and looking at uh, some of these areas, you see there are a number of somewhat rounded nuclei in here. And uh, occasionally they're sort of clustered together. And in addition, they sometimes have these little very uh, uh, orangophilic or slightly reddened um, inclusions that are not just red cells. Um, and so that's a, a clue there. Here's another example here. Uh, and notice how these are sort of blocked off. They're blocky. Uh, so uh, these would appear to be uh, crystalloids of uh, Renke, uh, indicating that an element of these stromal cells uh, are in fact uh, lighting cells, uh, making it uh, quite clear that we have the tubular component here that are Sertoli cells, and the stromal element uh, are light egg cells, uh, therefore characteristic of a uh, Sertoli light egg tumor. Now this example shows quite a number of uh, light egg cells and a nice uh, differential, uh, well-developed pattern of uh, Sertoli cells. Uh, in one area over here, we get a little bit less well differentiated, as you can see here. Uh, if it, the entire tumor uh, looked like this, uh, you would probably think uh, more of an intermediate differentiation or something. But where this is a minor component uh, and we have these well-developed tubules and abundant uh, lighting cells, this fits fairly well into the well-differentiated uh, pattern uh, of Sertoli lighting tumor. And uh, uh, we're very fortunate that in this case, the, the uh, light <coughs> crystalloids are fairly frequent uh, making it very uh, reasonable or very possible to identify uh, the lighting cells. Now, in addition to H&E stains, of course, oftentimes uh, in the resource-rich environment, uh, we may be inclined to do immunohistochemical stains. And here, as you can see, is one of these, a nice stain for inhibin. Uh, and the interesting thing about this, I think, is uh, the, you, it nicely highlights the differential uh, staining that is uh, seen with this stain in the two components of the tumor. So notice here the Sertoli component has a kind of faint uh, cytoplasmic uh, pattern, a little bit of uh, membranous accentuation, whereas the Leydig cell component is very strongly positive, very densely uh, staining and uh, uh, appears in the appropriate uh, environment there. Um, in addition to uh, this, we see a, a similar well, this is a nice summary slide of what we saw that I prepared. Uh, but also with calretinin, uh, we see again a differential pattern. Uh, in this case, the Sertoli uh, cells are essentially entirely negative, uh, whereas the lighting cells uh, light up quite strongly. And similarly with uh, melon A, we get a stronger stain with the stromal uh, lighting cell component and a more blushy type of positivity with the lighting cells. So while these markers are often touted as, as uh, sex cord stromal markers, the pattern of staining in a, in a given tumor can be somewhat individual, but also quite instructive and helpful in this situation. In contrast, WT1, also a marker of sex cord stromal tumors, uh, doesn't seem to care whether it's a lighting cell or a Sertoli cell, it just lights, lights them up and there they are. And you just can't tell uh, the difference between uh, the stromal cells versus the uh, uh, tubular uh, structures of the uh, Sertoli cells. Well, uh, and then just to reiterate, this is the pseudo-endometrioid pattern that we uh, spoke of earlier, 
where you get uh, tall columnar cells, uh, occasionally open nuclei, and uh, this appearance that somewhat resembles uh, endometrial type glands. So uh, what is sertoliolitic cell tumor? Well, it's a, an uncommon tumor to begin with. It's a less than 1% of ovarian tumors. And it comes with several grades and a variety of uh, different uh, patterns. Uh, and therefore it also has a, a spectrum of behavior as well. Um, additionally, this has uh, been characterized to have several molecular subtypes um, that are centered around these two genes, the DICER1 gene and the FOXL2 gene. DICER1 gene um, um, uh, codes for an RNAase 3 um, uh, <clears throat> uh, gene or pr protein product that is involved with uh, microRNA. Um, FOXL2, I think I don't know exactly outright at the tip of my tongue what that's involved, but uh, mutations in either one of these have been identified uh, as associated with uh, sertoliolitic cell tumor. But in addition, there are tumors that are wild type with either one of these. And so this is not, these are not the only pathways to get this. In addition, uh, both germline and sporadic, and sporadic, well, that's not a bad spelling there. Uh, sporadic mutations can be seen with the DICER1 uh, mutation. Um, most of the tumors, or 50% or a little bit more will exhibit some level of androgenic manifestations as in our patient. And most commonly, these are younger patients, uh, pediatric, uh, early adolescent, uh, young adulthood and so forth. But they have been associated with, or have been reported in postmenopausal women as well. And so you can't ever totally exclude the possibility of a sertoliolitic cell, cell tumor. Things that may portend a poorer prognosis are identification of heterologous elements, and that can include things like mucinous cystic elements or stromal elements like cartilage, bone, uh, skeletal muscle, and so forth. Uh, a ruptured tumor uh, generally portends a higher stage or poorer prognosis, and certainly any evidence of extra ovarian spread or the presence of the redeform architecture, uh, which we've described in an earlier uh, 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 video uh, are uh, adverse prognostic markers and things which you should be aware of uh, and present in your staging report. Now, just to give you a higher uh, magnification view, this is actually from a cytology preparation um, reported from a, a testicular aspirate, but very nicely illustrates what these crystalloids of Renke look like. Um, here on the left, an air-dried prep showing the negative staining with a right gimsa type stain, uh, the negative uh, reaction in the cytoplasm. And here in a more conventional PAP stained sample, you see the very bright uh, orangophilic or uh, eosinophilic uh, crystals, uh, sometimes fragmented and having somewhat blocky ends as you see there. Well, uh, we mentioned the DICER1 uh, gene, but in, in fact, this is not a, uh, an isolated story in the uh, ovary because uh, patients who have this uh, gene mutation have actually been identified uh, to have a syndrome called the DICER1 syndrome, um, which is inherited as an autosomal dominant, um, but has variable penetrance. Um, and it's associated with a variety of tumors and conditions that uh, may be a problem throughout life. Uh, these can include a, a benign lung tumor, a pleural, pleural pulmonary blastoma, which can dif be differentiated into a malignant form, uh, multinodular goiters, which are usually benign, the ovarian tumors that we've described, and these are more often the uh, less well differentiated and higher grade uh, tumors, uh, a variety of kidney tumors from cystic nephroma, but also Wilms tuber or anaplastic sarcomatoid uh, tumors, uh, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma of the cervix, so-called botryoid sarcoma, and several uh, brain tumors, pinealomas, and others, uh, tumors in the eye and the ciliary body, nasal tumors involving the chondroid matrix and so forth. These are quite uh, much less frequent, uh, uh, but uh, are quite unusual tumors in and of themselves. And so the identification of one of these uh, tumors can, should certainly lead to consideration of this uh, syndrome. Now, because this is uh, a variable uh, penetrant uh, tumor or syndrome, uh, genetic testing is certainly warranted, both in the uh, proband as well as in family members. And if identified, should uh, pr prompt a significant uh, long-term follow-up involving 
screening for ovarian, kidney, or thyroid lesions, possibly even some of these less frequent lesions uh, to uh, hope to help these uh, patients do as well as possible. And obviously, even within the same family, expression can be quite variable. Uh, so that uh, warrants uh, consideration as you counsel with patients about this. So our final sign out today is a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, uh, in our case, a well-differentiated tumor. Uh, uh, germline and testing, genetic testing is still pending on this patient. Um, but given that it's a well-differentiated tumor, it seems less likely that this is going to be a, a Dicer-1 syndrome uh, patient. Well, we hope you enjoyed that and certainly thank you for joining us on this program today. Uh, it's our pleasure to present these cases and to offer them to you as an educational benefit. And we hope that if you like them, that you'll feel free to hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel. Uh, you know that drill. Uh, it helps the channel out and it uh, helps to ensure that you receive notice when we uh, post new videos, which we uh, continue to do on a fairly regular basis. So until next time, uh, thanks so much for joining me.